Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you, um, President Wallace, for that lovely intro. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Ricky. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us, President Wallace. So are we good to jump right in? Sure. OK. Uh, so I thought maybe we'd just start from the beginning and telling us a little bit about your early days and, uh, and where you all got started. Yeah, I, um, I, I kind of, I, I grew up in Taiwan and, uh, you know, I, I think, I don't, people always ask me, like, when, when did you, you know, when did you catch the fashion bug? And I was like, I, I don't know, I don't really remember because I don't really remember never ha ever not having it, you know, and I, um, you know, I, I was in the, I was born in 82 and I was in Taiwan and I just remember, like, used to, I always wanted a bigger, si uh, an older sister, but I never got one. I got my brother, <laughs> right. which I love, who I love. But you know, so I always play with my cousin, right. and then so then she had all these Barbie dolls, and I just was like attracted to them. You know, I wanted to play with Barbie dolls and like you know style their hair and redress them and all of that, and um, and like you know no GI Joes and no Transformers. It was just not interesting for me. So that was like kind of my very, very early days. And that's kind of like, it just really attracted the beauty. To me, that wasn't, it wasn't really just about playing with dolls. It were just, I just thought they were so beautiful. And um, that's kind of how I kind of got into it all, I guess, from very early on. And, um, but of course, you know, in, in the 80s, Taiwan was really rather conservative. And, uh, and a lot of people, uh, thought it was really, you know, ridiculous for a boy to play with dolls. So my, my mom, my parents were super supportive, immigrated us to Canada so that we have like a little bit more of an accepting environment where we could, you know, I could do what I do. Right. And so your mother was incredibly supportive in that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, we moved to Canada. Um, she bought, I begged her to buy me a sewing machine then and uh, she bought me one right. and then and then she actually hired somebody to teach me how to sew after school. And that was a deal. Because I was terrible in class. Right. And like really terrible at math, especially. Which is a shame in Asian I th culture. I think we have that in common. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how we ended up here. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know. But that's like, you know. Like Asian people. Asian, like, you know, when we immigrated, all the other Asian students were like three, three classes ahead. I was like two behind. You know. So it wasn't like. So, you know, if I did. So I promise if I um, was good in school, she would um, let me take sewing lessons after class. Okay. And that, uh, while you were still in school, this became a full-time job for you, right? Well, then, um, not then, but like, you know, then I kind of, then I came to the States and went to boarding school. And then, you know, again, I was like quite bored and I, <laughs> you know, I was not, you know, I was definitely not playing lacrosse and I was not, right. you know, I was like trying to find myself and it was, you know, it was, again, it's quite academic and uh, I, I just, um, I, I took a train to New York from, um, um, from Massachusetts and came, went to New York mm -hmm. and um, visited this company called Integrity Toys and got a part-time job there. I don't know how that happened. It kind of sounds ridiculous now that I say it, but like, I don't know. It was like, I, right. it was like I, I don't know. I just felt like I wanted to do something like that. And I started working there part time from school. So okay. um, that's kind of how, um, how it all happened. But it's, it's, you know, now that I talk about it, it sounds kind of crazy. I love it. So, at what point did you say, did you translate from dolls to women's fashion? Well, I really wanted to. I mean, the thing is, I, I, kind of learned what fashion was, like when I was like 11, 12, when I was starting to learn English. Mm -hmm. um, um, I had a really great mentor, tutor, um, um, that we, we're still very close today. Her name is Muriel, and she, um, she taught me English, but then she always, she kind of figured out I didn't really learn the same way as my brother. My brother is much better at like instructions and reading and be good at homework. And I'm just like really like fidgety, I need to be everywhere, I need to look at things, you know? And then she realized, so like, then she realized one day I was like looking at my mom's like fashion magazines and I was like very fixated on it. And so she started teaching me how to read the articles in the fashion magazines so I could apply my interest to the language. And that's kind of how I picked up the language. So that's kind of when I already wanted to do, be a fashion designer. It was really from then on. And I, I would say doll was, a, you know, being a professional doll maker was a something I didn't expect, right. but you know, enjoyed a lot. I mean, it was great. And you left school a little early, right? 
Yeah, a little early, like、um, six months before. Not that we want to promote that by any means, but <laughs> stay in school. <laughs> but yes, it's true.、Right. And、um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I just felt like I wanted to.、Um, I don't know. I wanted to start something, and you know, it was kind of like irrational. And as and any, how old were you when that? I was when like twenty three. Okay. Twenty three when like that whole thing happened. So yeah, I mean, just kind of decided like, hey, you know, why not? I would soon realize a lot of reasons why not, but you know, like <laughs> we'll get into some of those. We'll get after, into that, right? <laughs> Just easing in. So,、uh, as President Wallace mentioned, obviously a huge part of your early story is、mm-hmm. uh, you were 26 years old,、yeah. and Michelle Obama wears your dress to the inauguration ball,、yeah. which was such an iconic moment for you and also、uh, for fashion in general. Yeah.、Uh, so, if you could just tell us a little bit about that experience,、yeah. what it meant to your business. I, 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 you know, it was just,、um, you know, I mean, probably like most people thought I started the day before inauguration.、Right. <laughs> But the truth is, I mean, you know me for a long time. You know, I've been working. You know, I, I was at it for a few years. You know, we were,、um, you know, you know, starting a base. You know, we were working with all the stores and everything. And when 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 that happened, it was kind of just kind of brought the brand and the, you know, the name. Into it, onto a more international、um, platform, which was really amazing. And but you know, like I, I, I never. The whole thing kind of just happened really quickly. I, I remember getting a call and saying, like, you know, do you want to?、Um, one, one September is like, oh, would you like to、um, work with、um, Mrs. Obama? And I'm like, I don't know who she is, but I will look <laughs> it up. And then this is like before. Glad you did. I, I, you know,、right. like. Not great at politics, you know. <laughs> and、um, so I looked. I was like,、oh, sure. So we started working together, like probably、um, when was this? Yeah, a, a year before the inauguration. So, and then we kind of just kept working together. And then when the inauguration time came, I I said, okay, sure. You know, I'll 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 put in a sketch,、right. and I just sent one, you know,、right. because we had no time. And I was just like, you know, I was just I had this one idea. And then、so、I just drew it down really quickly, and I sent it. We just had to do it all really quickly, and then,、um, yeah, I was.、Uh, and then, and then, really, I didn't know anything until the night of、so、that she was going to wear. No, I mean,、surprise. I had a feeling that it was a good chance because you know we did a lot of things、okay. to make you know with the dress, but I really didn't know. I was in the dark, and、um, and. And I actually had never seen an inauguration before, <laughs> and I was like that year everybody <laughs> was watching it. All,、right. You know, like Beyonce was performing, and like、right. it was like <laughs> it was like a really, you know, it was like a real moment. You know, it was really an amazing, I mean, this moment, especially for for me who、um, who's an immigrant, when I wanted to come to the states my entire life, you know, and to kind of be a part of coming something that was not only really special but also historical moment,、right. and.、Um, And all of a sudden, I was home, and I, you know, I remember we had, had a box of pizza. We were like just watching TV, and she came out in the dress, and I kind of just like lost it.、Right. You know, it was like it was it was amazing. As a friend of ours, Jason and I met、um, when I was working at Vogue, and an editor who we worked very close with, Meredith, said he went from Jason Who to Jason Wu. <laughs>、uh, <laughs> so.、Uh, Well, while we're on the subject of sort of very iconic women wearing your clothes, and we'll we'll dive a little deeper into、yeah. the clothes themselves, but、uh, dressing celebrities has been such a huge part of your DNA.、Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that, obviously Michelle Obama put you on the map, but you've really leveraged your relationships and、um, you know who are people that you love to dress, and what is that what has that done for your business? I mean, I think it's you know I I I think I've always you know you know I what I do is you know I I love. Glamorous. I love feminine, and it just kind of lent itself to working with、uh, um, a lot of women who work in film. So,、um, and and、uh, you know, one of my dearest friends, Diane Kruger, is somebody that I've worked with、um, for many, many, many years.、Okay. And、uh, and we just kind of like, our relationship is, you know, we, I, it's not it's not just it's not about like presenting sketches or you know making it all very official. We do things by text, and we just kind of have a flow. And when we Think about a look. We we really collaborate in every sense, and that actually in itself、um, sometimes makes its way into the collections. You know, because it's somebody that's I you know I really respect her opinion. I think she's amazing taste, and、um, we're like a, you know we're, we're true collaborators. So you know it's been really、um, you know she's been、uh, 
a huge influence on my work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think we've done some, some things I'm really proud of together on the red carpet. So you mentioned about your collection being so feminine and lending itself really well to the red carpet. So yeah. how did you come to making that the crux of your brand, right? What are some of the, as you were developing your collection, what your signatures were? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I was always really into it. I mean, I was, um, you know, my favorite designers are Charles James and um, Yves Saint Laurent. And uh, so, you know, I, I and, and one of the earliest Vogue um, editorials I remember, it was like 93, Amber Valletta was on the cover and it was like a Christian Lacroix editorial. It was really like one that I really remembered. And like, that was like, so, you know, I guess that's when, like, you know, I, I guess I was just naturally attracted to designers like that. So, and I, I remember, you know, I was, I went to the Met every year to see the exhibit. I was like the highlight, you know, and study the work up close. So I think there's like this, so I, I guess, I don't know, I, I, I never knew, it and I just, I, it was like love is first sight. So, you know, I really, um, and, and, you know, and, just growing up watching a lot of old movies and I was, I'm reading into like the 50s Hollywood era and, and so I guess all of that informed, um, it informed my career thus far. And you're still making most of your clothes in New York. Yeah, 90% of them are made in New York, and New York City, yeah. Is that something you want to continue? What does that sort of mean to you and how you develop your fabrics and yeah. speak a little to so, you know, you know, I go to Italy and France, like, you know, a couple times a year to develop fabrics. And I think that's still really amazing to be able to do that and see the fabric weaving and all right. of that happening. It's like, and that's really my favorite part, you know, from developing the fabrication every season to, you know, thinking about the overall concept and then, you know, having an atelier um, in New York to make it and then being able to manufacture next door, you know, it's like kind of... Um, great to be able to see, physically see everything right. coming to life, you know, and that's, that's always going to be the part I like the most, is the, the creative process of seeing how a, a lifetime of a dress, like how, a lifespan of a dress, right. how it comes from an idea to being a reality. I right. think that's, that's the magic. Completely. So I'm, I don't know how much you all know, but Jason is the busiest man in fashion and has <laughs> done several collaborations, many of which Paul, uh, President Wallace had mentioned before. Um, but taking your collections and really building off of, obviously, the runway, which we all know and, and see. But um, you've done collaborations in the beauty space with Lancome. You've yeah. done Target, which was uh, wildly successful. You've done dolls for Bergdorf. Uh, talk to us a little bit about those collaborations, the difference between yeah. beauty and fashion, and how it relates back to your brand. Yeah, I mean, I always think to myself, you know, I, you, I, and, and, and I, I love to design, you know, and, and obviously I'm a fashion designer. I love fashion, you know, but um, I, I, I do believe that, you know, if you have an aesthetic or a point of view, you could really um, lend that to any and everything. And, you know, because my um, coming into fashion came from a very unusual <laughs> angle, which is from toys. And, you know, it wasn't like, and, and just to paint a picture for everyone, it wasn't me like in a room sewing little clothes. Like, <laughs> I had to go to China, like when I was 17, and like every summer and spring break, and like, go look at like plastic factories and like work with sculptors and like, you know, like, look at hair charts and like all of that, right. figuring out how to package it. And then like, and that's actually where I learned um, doing dolls, how to do like registrate, um, do registration for trademarks okay. and patents. Important so things. like all those things is what I, you know, I, I got to learn all of that through doing toys. Right. And so I kind of come from things and from a very product design point of view, you know, so I, I, I think about the overall, the bigger picture, the whole thing, you right. know, and so that's really my background. So. I, I really, you know, I'm really inspired by doing, you know, collaborating with other design industries. You know, I, I love architecture. I, um, I love, you know, I love anything that has a point of view, anything that has an aesthetic, aesthetic to it that I can, I can change or I can um, put, my, um, put my stamp on. And how has that helped you from almost a visibility standpoint as well for the collection? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a big world. And I think to, um, you know, to establish myself not only in fashion, but in um, other design categories has been very, really, really good for the brand. Because we, we think about 
you know, Jason was an entire lifestyle, and I think that's something that I've always just been really drawn to. Right. Are there other people you're hoping to collaborate with in the future? Yeah, I would love to do a furniture, furniture. something. That's great. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting. Fabulous. So speaking of uh, extensions and collaborations and working with others, um, Jason launched a fragrance in August 2017, yep. uh, which we brought, I've been told this is the small version. This is the mini one. <laughs> brought the wrong one. Um, but, you know, obviously that's a dream for any designer to get into fragrance yeah. and uh, describe to us what it, what it was like to collaborate on the fragrance and how you chose the notes that you chose. It was great. I mean, you know, um, I, I, had, um, I had worked on, um, I know I had worked with Hugo Boss and I had handled all their fragrance you know, fragrances when I was there. So I kind of got my experience of that, that process there. And um, when it came down time, and there's an opportunity to launch my own fragrance, it was really exciting because I, I really do love the process, you know, and uh, I think smell is something that's everybody's very sensitive to, whether you know it or not. You know, it's something that's quite instinctual. And a good smell can remind you of something really wonderful versus, you know, like, an ex-boyfriend's cologne is bad, you know? Like, you know, that's how powerful it is. I mean, when you walk into the room before you see anything or before you hear anything, you smell, you know? And that's kind of one of the most important um, senses in terms of, like, a st setting, a, setting a scene, right? right? And, um, and so, you know, I, it was really fun. I, I worked with the perfumer. His name is Frank. Um, and uh, we, we smell about like 200 different ingredients, raw ingredients, I, you know, and, and it's more like kind of a personality test on what you like, your olfactory um, test, I guess. And, you know, we, we, we kind of just went through a bunch of different smells and he needs, you know, he would look at me and see my reaction, like, you know, do I like something, I don't like something, that kind of thing. And then I smelled this one thing and I was like, it just smells so like, really, really familiar, but I don't remember, remember where. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I asked him what it was, it was kind of a blind test, and I was kept going back to this one scent. And he's like, oh, it's a jasmine. And then I was like, oh, because basically my, my dad used to garden a lot um, in Taiwan, and we had a lot of jasmines, and I remember that. And, and like, it was quite a common flower in my neighborhood in Taiwan. Okay. And I remember that's why I loved it so much, because it was something that really brought me back to like a very, you know, a play, you know, it was, it was just, it, it was a great chapter and I, I, I felt really nostalgic to it and I wanted to create a fragrance around that one ingredient and that's kind of how the whole thing um, came about and, uh, and that again goes back to how powerful scent is because, right. you know, it can really, you know, um, remind you of something, a memory that you don't even know you remember. So is your office, do you come in every morning and spray all the clothes? No, okay. All right. Sometimes. <laughs> and you have more fragrances coming out as well. Yeah, I mean, like, lately I've been doing a lot of fragrance work, so, okay. like, the office has been um, quite perfumey. Right. Might have gotten a few complaints with HR, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> Turn it down. Uh, well, you actually, you mentioned something, but about Hugo Boss. So yeah. that was something I wanted to talk to you about. And we, uh, with a lot of designers, it's always the question of when you have your own brand, you're yeah. on this path of success, you're in a lot of stores, and a big brand comes calling. Um, and if you can tell us about that process, what, you know, obviously there are a lot of motivations to do it, but some learnings that come with it on how to balance yeah. both. I mean, it was, it, it was great. I mean, you know, I did it for five years, and, you know, it was really, um, I, I always say, like, kind of, like, entered fashion backwards. I never really worked for another fashion company before I started. Right. And then so um, going to a huge company that's like 90 something years old with a huge structure in place was something that was kind of daunting in the beginning, but it was also really exciting because it was um, about um, my translation of the Hugo Boss DNA. So it was really, um, it was a great project. And also I just got to learn a lot about, you know, crazy things like still retail operations and how to do visual merchandising and then how to do the perfume to like, you know, I kind of had my hands in everything and that's kind of what I love, you know, you know, again, having my hands in a lot of things and seeing how it all comes together. You and know. how did it affect Jason Wu, the label? Your well, I definitely started thinking bigger after, um, you know, working at Hugo Boss. It's like, you need to think about, um, you know, when I started, you know, 10 years ago, it was about this like 
little business. I'm like happy to like, you know, I'm at Bergdorf's and like I'm happy to have my rack and to think about like right. <laughs> that. I want to make pretty clothes versus like now, you know, you can think, okay, where is it going to go in the next 10 years and how are we going to take it there and what's the strategy and how do you look at the business as a whole? Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, having worked in a company that's quite frankly a, a machine um, really kind of taught me and showed me kind of what the future could look like. Right, right. Uh, well, so now you are fully focused on your label yeah. and projects like Fragrance, and I'm sure many more to come that yeah. you, well, next time we're back, we'll talk about. Uh, so a little bit more about some of your recent collections mm -hmm. um, and sort of what you took from Hugo Boss as you came back. Was there pressure to back on the brand? How did it, how did it make you feel? I, mean, back I think it was the right time for me, you know, like I, I, I was traveling a lot to Europe mm -hmm. and uh, I really wanted to do a lot more in Asia um, in the coming years. So I've been going um, quite often. So I wanted to just, you know, I want and as as with any any one creative change is always exciting and good, right. you know, and uh, and yeah, it feels nice to be able to like have a little bit more time to um, be in a studio. I mean, I remember like for, for the last five years, every single day was like scheduled from every hour on right. with meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings. And, and kind of like was a lot, became very businessy and less creative. And I really wanted to go back to being creative. Right. Like I just had three hours free yesterday in the office and I just did things, creative things, you know, like I play with fabrics and you know, I had time to think, and I hadn't had that in so many years, and I forgot what it was like. Yeah. And I felt I was getting really far from my work. And, um, and I, I love being able to have time, you know? It's something that sounds really simple, but we don't really have that so much anymore with um, four seasons a year, always shipping clothing, always selling clothing. You know, you're always in, in, you're always in some sort of market appointments, and right. I did that times two, and we kind of just kind of don't remember why you're doing it, right. you know? And I, I kind of fell back in love a little bit this year. That's great. You, you felt it in that collection. Uh, well, part, part of that, obviously, um, I think it's really unique that you are part of a generation of where the internet has been omnipresent yeah. in, in what you do. So yeah. I guess talk a little bit about the role of social media and obviously the pressure that comes with always having the spotlight on you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's you know, it, the days are gone where the designers can be purely behind the scene, right. right? We almost, we have to be the brand and we have to be the face of the brand and the force behind the brand and everything. It's all kind of mixed together a little bit. I mean, I, I don't, I... I, I don't really mind sharing, you know, like, you know, I mean, if anyone like subscribe to my Instagram, like my, my stories are like just me, you know, right. and it's like, I kind of, I, I think it's a nice outlet. I was never very good at keeping a journal. So that's kind of a nice way to do it. A visual um, journal. Yeah. Sometimes I've like realized a lot of people are watching. So I, so not after five martinis, don't, don't Instagram story. <laughs> Do you do your own Instagram account? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, for the post, like, I have some help, but then, like, the stories is, like, me uncuffed. Right. So, a bit dangerous. Right. But it's kind of fun. <laughs> but I do love Instagram, though. I'm, like, on all the time, you know. I think it's, like, yeah. a good way for me to keep up with my friends. And, uh, right. and also just, you know, I found a lot of different people on Instagram, you know, to, uh, that, you know, created yeah. people that, yeah. you know, I would never otherwise have encountered. And with customers, has that broken down some of the barriers too? Yeah, I talk to my customers on Instagram, like, right. you know, messages. And, uh, you know, I think it's just like, you know, it's, it becomes a way to share my work in a more 360 degree kind of way, which actually sometimes is exhausting too. Because right. it's like, oh, what are you going to post this week? You know, you know now I have to, we have to talk about it, you know. So, some, yeah, it's, it, it, it comes with its downsides too, you know. Like, you're just so glued on it all the time. It needs content all the time, which I know you know. Yes. It's like if content and likes. <laughs> and I love getting, a, you know, my friend Eva telling me, Jason, your engagement needs to be higher. And, like, you know, we need more of this and more of that. I was like, oh, now it's a work, it's you know. Right. And... Uh, yeah, but you know, I think it's it. But but I think it's great. Yeah. So speaking of uh, attention and living under this microscope, um, you would obviously the 
uh, Michelle Obama inauguration put you on the map, but you had been doing a lot in, within the industry, as you said, leading yeah. up to that moment. Yeah. And a big part of that was the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so one of you talked a little bit about that, but also the role of competition in fashion and, yeah. and what it was, because you did the Fashion Fund, I think, in 2006, yeah. which was obviously predated Instagram and, and yeah. we no, it was great. I mean, you know, that, that, that experience was very significant because um, especially during that time, um, I think we were the fifth year. Right. It was really the, the thing that kind of give, gave you a platform to stand out in the industry. And that was really what's particularly so special about that because it was a moment where, you know, there wasn't that many young designers who were able to start and get a platform, especially in Europe. And there in New York was this platform where, you know, we were able to be exposed to all the right people and be able to, you know, be able to really kind of refine our message. You know, that competition was really the most of the exercises about you being absolutely sure about what your vision is, is what it was. Because every exercise you have to do, and there were a lot of them, had to, you had to be absolutely sure what your point of view was. And if you didn't, it would show, you know? Right. And so, yeah, it was a very rigorous process, and, but it was like really wonderful, it was great, you know? And uh, super, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, it was super competitive at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't win, but, you know. <laughs> right, but they say that that's, the one who wins is one that doesn't win in the long run. So. It's fine. <laughs> I was crushed at the time, though. So I <laughs> didn't change that. I was like, oh my God. Okay. Yeah, but you know, I mean, yeah. you know, you win thinking, some, you lose some, right? <laughs> you've been on the other side of it too, because with Woolmark Prize, you yeah. became a judge. So yeah. how did you view doing it that many years down the road and seeing it as a judge? Yeah, I mean, I think you really like, then, you know, you're, you kind of ask the questions that, you know, you know, from a designer point of view, it's like that I had to answer at one point, like, what are your stores? What's your retail distribution? Where are you made? What's your price point? And all those things, you know, right. like that became kind of necessary that um, you kind of have to ask because you want to make sure whoever you select to win has not only amazing designs, but also has a business, right. you know, it has a foundation of a successful business if you want to see that person succeed. Right, right. Um, and speaking of business and growing it and, and again, you clearly felt you had some time <laughs> and you started Gray. Yeah. So tell us about Gray and going into a sister line and what the yeah. motivation was for that. So, you know, Jason was always been like more, I would say like on duty. It's right. well, more glamorous and I wanted to create a collection that was more off duty. It's something that was more casual, weekends, things might, you know, um, and, and so the idea was to that explore that other side of myself. So it's, um, you know, it's been two years and, um, you know, I love the idea of being able to explore like a more casual side of what Jason will look like. And, you know, I think the two has quite a nice synergy together um, now after, you know, um, having them together for two years. And, uh, and, you know, now that I have my full time at Jason Wu, it's, um, you know, it's, it's going to be great to see how, how that grows. Right. And do you see them mixing? Like, how do you view fashion when you've got a lower price point versus a higher price point and also casual and, and where do you see I mean it's just all mixed nowadays right? right I mean I think you know gone are the days where people really wear head to toe one brand right. you know unless it's a red carpet or something like that but like people mix and I think it's just more modern and people are much more casual and so um, the relationship between dressy and casual has become somewhat crossed you know so I think that's important to have both and uh, I do think once in a while dressing up like, like that is still nice. You know, I do love to wear a suit, but I'm in this most of the time. Right, right, I know you are. Yeah. You play both. Um, and when it comes to stores, we were backstage and talking about China and how you're growing in China, but also yeah. all new stores and net the success of net a -Porte for your brand. Tell yeah. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with the stores. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, that, that was actually kind of amazing to think back. I remember, um, um, I think about, Le about a decade ago, you know, I heard about this website called Neta Porte, and it was in new. And this super chic woman came in. Her name was Natalie Massenet, okay. and she picked up the collection. You know, I remember she was wearing like the best necklace, and she was like super chic, and like, and I was in, like my little studio slash showroom, right. and 
I was like, oh, it's a new little website thing that we're like sell to, right. to see like in this amount of time, which is not really that long, it's become an international powerhouse, mm -hmm. you know, um, that is more successful than ever. So that's kind of my, my career, my 20s, is seeing how the internet completely changed the industry, right. you know, completely. I remember I moved to New York when, in 2001, mm -hmm. and we just started having wireless at Parsons that year. That was like the first time I've ever heard. I was like, internet with no wires? That's amazing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Look at where we are now. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but like my life is about that, you know? Right. Right. So then, then like when I talk about it, I was like, oh geez, I sound so old, you know? <laughs> I was like, I remember those AOL discs that you have to download and like, you know, dial right. up and all of that to like discovering wireless right. and then having the iPhone. Right. Like that all kind of happened in the span of my career. Right. And so it's kind of incredible to see how it's really evolved. And are you fully in? I mean, how do you feel about brick and mortar versus? I, I mean, I do, I do love the in-store experience, but I do think, you know, I think right now shops have to be just much more than shops. You know, I think people want the full experience. And again, you know, you need, um, you know, it's so easy. Everything's at a tap. You know, you can get anything delivered, especially in New York. You know, I, don't, I haven't gone to the grocery store in a very long time. You know, you can just buy everything on Amazon Prime, you know, and it's so easy. But I have to say, you know, when, when, when I'm traveling, mm -hmm. um, when I'm not in my element, I love, I love going to stores. I think it's really nice. You know, I still think there's magic in being in an environment and being enchanted and completely enthralled by everything about it. But I do think those experiences have to be heightened nowadays, you know? Mm -hmm. I think people aren't just gonna go into a shop, you know, just to buy some clothes. Right. You know, I think you have to romance that a little bit. It has to be an entire experience. You have to give people a reason to leave home. Right, right. And I do think, um, you were talking before about how Bergdorf is is your woman, right? Yeah. So how much are you thinking about what the collection looks like and where it's going to be? I mean, your trunk shows, like, sort of how much is your role of having to be present and really talk directly with your customer evolve? I mean, it's quite important, especially, like, you know, for, you know, for me, it's, um, I have a great relationship with a lot of my clients. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's important to know who your customer is. You know, I think that's, at the end, very important. I think it's a, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's your business. It's the entire business to know who your client is, you know? And, you know, just became, um, you know, great friends with a lot of them. And, uh, and that's kind of, you know, where it all comes full circle. You know, I've become very involved in, you know, things they do and, you know, getting inspired by that. A lot of them, you know, um, you know, and from different, diff a lot of them have different careers. Some of them are in the arts, some are architects, whatever, you know, just, you, you you meet a lot of interesting people that way, and that kind of feeds back into your work. Right. And I guess while we're, what do you like to do when you're not doing fashion? Uh, <laughs> how important is that side? Because it sounds like all you do is work. So what, how important is I mean, it is, is but like, you know, I, I love balance. it. You know, I love doing what I do. So yeah. it doesn't, it, I don't feel, I don't really feel belabored. Like I don't feel like dreading work or anything, which, right. You know, I'm very lucky to say, you know, like I, I, I really do enjoy what I do. I mean, you know, when it comes to a budget meeting, I may not like it so much, but like, you know, most of the time I like work and it's okay, you know, right. and, uh, but I like to be creative. So I like to just, you know, I, that's why I love doing different collaborations because it really allows me to see into another world, you know, when I'm working with somebody else. And, and that's something that fuels my creativity a lot. But um, I do love cooking, like that's my, downtime fave. What is? Cooking. Cooking, cooking oh, yeah. What's, what's your dish, your signature dish? I think mean, I just kind of like, you know, I, you know, I'm not a great baker, I'm a better cook, because like I don't really, I'm not good at following recipes, so I just kind of, I'll see what's available, and <laughs> you know, I'll make something out of it. <laughs> right. So you have a show um, coming up, you do four collections a year, yeah. Jason Wu, and for Gray, Four. Four. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about uh, the evolving fashion week? And as you go to prepare for your show in September, how much do you make of, obviously we've watched See Now, Buy Now, uh, mm -hmm. we, people have shifted from showing in New York to showing in Paris. Mm -hmm. like, what, are, what are your thoughts on fashion week as it is now? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's at a crossroads right now for sure, because I think, you know, the business is changing 
more rapidly than ever before. And I think we're used, fashion, we're used to being ahead. Right. But then when everything else is so fast, we're all of a sudden not so ahead anymore. So, you know, I think it's the industry trying to figure itself out on how to cope with this crazy speed that really is quite impossible to keep up with. Yeah. So for me, it's like, keep the eye on the, you know, I, I, I really haven't participated in any of the movements or whatever right. one would want to call it. I mean, I just think, I just want to concentrate on the clothes, you know, I, that's what I want to do. Like I, so you I, feel I, a show I, is really I, the, I, the best vehicle to do that? Well, I, 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 I you know, I, I just think it's like, you know, I, I think for me, it's about, you know, I, first of all, I, I love New York and it's like, I spent my entire life trying to move to New York, so I don't want to show anywhere else. Right. You know, like I like it took me so much time to get there that yeah. I have a certain, um, I guess, um, loyalty to it. And, you know, and it's just really my favorite city in the world. And so, yeah, but I do think, you know, fashion, we're going we're gonna to always rethink how we do things a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do in September yet, but like, you know, it, 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 I think I think there's no rules anymore. Right. I, I really don't. It's so interesting because when I was looking at the perfume, I remember that you actually did your perfume debut on the runway. Yeah, right? exactly. Like all the floral elements were, you know, flowers. Like I love flowers. And right. um, so there's always kind of a floral element in all my collections. And um, yeah, so it really made the, the story of creating the perfume into the collection, which was something that was just literally what I was doing during the time of a collection. So it felt really natural. Right. And it's such a platform where you can really put any project that you have in the yeah, works in yeah. front of people. Yeah, and I do think there's, um, you know, I mean, with the internet and everything, I still think there's a lot of magic in seeing beautiful clothes up close. Right. You know, I think that's, you know, it's continues to be the reason I go to like every Met Museum, like every Met exhibit like multiple times every year, you know? You go, you go yeah, you just, it's, yeah, it's kind of amazing. I mean, you can see like, you know, the craftsmanship behind it all and that there's so much history and so much craftsmanship and, you know, in, within so, so much story to tell within the clothes that I don't think that that would ever um, be taken over by digital to see right. things up close, that experience. Right, right. Well, and they can, when you start your furniture line, yes. they'll just complete the whole, because I guess now it's, it's so much more about the brand itself, right? Thinking through um, the overall, but knowing if you had, because no. you have a store, you do not have a store, but if you were to have one, how much do you think about what the store would look like? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I opened like a store and store within Saks last year, and that's like the first time I started thinking about it. And I worked with um, architect Andre Malone, who um, worked with me on the bottle, because um, um, he's, a, you know, he designed my apartment, he's like a close friend, and, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like the relationship was just very organic. So when we um, came to designing the stores, he designed it. And, you know, as we go into the next phases of, having more retail locations, that's something we're definitely talking about. But yeah, I mean, I think about, but when I think about a store, I just think about where do I want to be and where do I want to live? That's really how I think about it, you know? It's not about, um, you know, how much product I can hang on this to me. For me, it's, to me, it's more like, where do I want to be and where do I, what's, what's the most ideal version of an interior where I can, you know, where the clothes would live, you know, that, that, that's, that's how I think of it. Right, right. Where do I want to spend time in? Right. So are there any projects that you want to do that you're not doing? Or any future collaborators? There's a couple things that. happening coming up. I don't know if I can... Hmm. <laughs> well, while you think about that, I'm getting the, the um, signal that we are opening up to questions. I love the last question. It's the one that stumped me. Like, hmm. Right. I guess that's why she started standing up. <laughs> All right, I think we have our first one right here. Should I stand up? Hi, um, my name's Callie. I just wanted to say thank you for coming and speaking with us. Um, I'm a junior fashion design major, and I wanted to ask you just kind of the generic question of what advice would you give to us in learning in, our, in SCAD and how we can pursue ourselves since you have such an iconic um, brand that is your own namesake? So how do you, sorry. Use your namesake to create a brand. 
Well, I think it's about, you know, I think it's about being authentic and being something what you like. Um, don't, don't conform to what you think you need to be. Yeah. Um, I think that's the biggest lesson I learned in the first few years. I always, I mean, I remember me, like, I always had, like, a much more, they'd say, uptown aesthetic, right? And, like, at the time when I was starting out, everybody was, like, much more cool and downtown. And I always thought, oh, should I be that? But then I just, like, don't know how to do that. And <laughs> I don't, you know, like, right. I do like a nice afternoon tea. <laughs> I've been known that's why to, we're friends. Known, known to enjoy rosé starting at 4 p.m. You know, like, I like right. that. It's just who I am. It's who I am, yeah. you know? And it took me a bit to get there, though. Like, yeah. you know, it took me, you know, but to be yourself is, I think, the utmost important thing because mm -hmm. authenticity is what makes brands. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jason. Thank you Hi. for your presentation. Um, my name is Sheila, and I'm currently studying fashion design. And I kind of want to hear more about what um, the process that happened after you left school. So what was that like starting your own company? And how did you even finance that or find the people to come on board when they didn't know what to expect from such a new company? Um, you know, it was really crazy. I mean, I, I, um, so I actually got the seed money from working in toys. So I had, that's how the seed money of my company came from. And so, um, and I mean, it was near, not nearly enough that I learned, but then, you know, like, yeah, it was very different. But um, yeah, and then I, I, I just started. I mean, I found like a one pattern maker and I started sketching and then figure out how to buy fabric all of a sudden. And then I would run into like, by the time I had started my business, a lot of my friends had started working in the industry already, so it was just like, and I would run into them in the garment district. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of stopped anyone I knew and asked them how to do things. Like, I didn't know how to grade patterns from two different sizes, and my friend would just got a, had just gotten a job at Gap, and I was like, how do you do this? You know, and you just kind of just ask everything, you know? And then you, it was like a lot of trial and error, to be honest, and it was really just by myself for a while. And then one of my close friends, Michelle, who, um, when we interned together, we've known each other for like 12 years. She was um, working at Bergdorf's um, after design school, and I was like, you need to quit, I need your help immediately. And that's kind of how I got my first employee. Mm -hmm. I forced her to do it, <laughs> you know? Is she still with you? Yes, right. she's now, you know, she, yeah, now she's, um, she's running the brand, but she's, uh, she's lovely, and you know, we grew up together, but there was so much trials and tribulations was so crazy in the beginning. But yeah, I mean, we just, we, 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 we grabbed onto whatever we could. We learned whenever we could, and we knew every single day we were making great mistakes, like <laughs> every day. But you know, you kind of just deal with it. Mm -hmm. But that's actually some of my favorite times. I remember when we, um, our first fashion week, um, we were obviously on every model's last schedule to come for fitting, and we'd just be in the studio f until like, um, one and two every day, like three days. And we just like, and it was just a bunch of friends helping and we started playing Monopoly. And you know, that, I don't have time to do that anymore. But like, that was like, it was great. Yeah. But terrifying. Hi, Jason. I have, thank you for finding the time of your busy schedule to come here. I have two questions. Aside from a designer, you're also a businessman. Where do you draw the line if, so that one doesn't overwhelm the other? And for another question is, although you said you wouldn't take, uh, the digital wouldn't take over you, uh, where do you see your brand in the future implementing technology for its growth? So, ooh, very professional questions. <laughs> so the first, <laughs> well, the first one, um, I mean, it's hard, you know, like I, I, I was, doing everything in the beginning, and, um, and I, I did find it very difficult to have to, you know, do accounting one day, which I was terrible at, and then to, like, dis you know, having to be creative, and then having to stick on schedule. I mean, fortunately, like, my husband, um, Gustavo, he really, like, I wrangled him into it, because he did, like, always paid the rent and stuff like that, like, <laughs> like you know, kept the lights on and all of that. 
you know, somebody has to do that. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you're good at that, so why don't you do that at work? And then so that's <laughs> kind of how it happened. So I was pretty lucky to have somebody that helped me with that um, in my career. But yeah, it was, you know, important that um, to know, you know, to, to really, like, as a designer, I think it's important that, um, you know, you have help in that department. You know, I think it's important to know about both. But um, at the end, you know, I was not, I mean, it was I, not a business major. It never was my, I have in, business instincts, but I, you know, I, I, it was important that um, I had the right support mm -hmm. there. And so that's question one. And question two, digital, I mean, I, I, you know, who knows where it, it could lead, right? But I just think, you know, I think virtual reality is going to be really important coming up. I think there's incredible things. And I think we have, haven't really found the right way to, like, figure out how to apply that to fashion. But, you know, um, like I went to the um, Oculus campus last year and kind of like had a whole virtual reality day. And it's really quite incredible because it's something that really makes you feel like you've transported yourself into a different environment and takes the idea of viewing something, experiencing something to a whole next level. Mm -hmm. And I also imagine like, can we smell one day digitally? I don't know, you know? like. Seems like nothing is impossible. So the way we experience things is certainly going to be greatly enhanced by by the digital era. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Right here. Hi. Uh, I just want to say thank you for being here and taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Um, my name is Lucy, and I'm a freshman fashion design student. And my question for you is, what is the most important lesson that you've learned throughout your career about fashion design? About fashion design? Um, I, I would say it's more of a general thing. It's just never, like, you know, I, I, I think when I was much younger, I was, I really did think I knew it all, but I really didn't, you know? And it took me very long, like, you know, took me a long time, the first year I realized that. But like, you know, to really, um, but, but I think the most important lesson is you always, kind of have to be the student, you know, I don't think, I think the second you think you've done it all, um, I think, you, I, you know, is I think when it's, it's over, you know, I think you want to keep exploring, and there's always something you don't know, I don't care who you are, or I don't care, like, where you are, I don't know how old you are, there's always something you don't know, you know, and I think it's, it's important to keep learning, even if things that don't initially think you think would be interesting. Well, thank you so much, thank Jason. You. Thank you for doing that.